because even though what you're putting up, let's say you're using a projected screen, okay. and your projected screen can have some motion, just adding the motion of a person across the stage mm -hmm. adds visual interest and adds to the tenor and the change of pace, and you can walk to the edge as you're trying to catch people's attention mm -hmm. and just look down at them. If it, In some cases it's down, in some cases it's up, but it allows you to become ever more personal as you move around and simply adds to the ability of the person to be interesting to watch. Do you ever actually go into the audience? Infrequently. Um, I do uh, occasionally, but pretty much infrequently. Mm -hmm. um, most recently, I've been teaching in Javits 100, and it would require a few stairs to go down. I suppose that's not much of an impediment, and I should consider it, because that would make a very nice contact. Mm -hmm. um, and with the technology today, with the microphone, with remote drawing tools, yeah. you actually don't have to be on the stage anymore mm -hmm. to, to do your presentation. Good suggestion. That could be interesting, mm -hmm. because, yeah, having the prof in your face. Especially uh. in the back row. <laughs> You're not going to sleep in that yeah. case. Especially in the back row, mm -hmm. you know, where you tend to get the students who, who tend to be reading the newspaper or today using their oh, good PDAs. Su good suggestion, good suggestion. I mm -hmm. haven't used the remote drawing tools yet, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, that's a neat idea. Now, there's the old adage about lecturing, that a lecture is where content goes from the faculty member's mind into the student's mind with neither, neither one thinking in between. Because essentially it's a delivery mechanism. It's a way of getting information from you to the students that they then need to digest and work on and learn. Do you agree with that? Um, not really. Um, lecture can devolve to that. Mm -hmm. um, but it shouldn't be that. Uh, if you ask yourself, what do you remember in lecture? Mm -hmm. You probably remember when the prof was wrong. Or when he told a story. Or when he told a story. Uh -huh. Or when he slipped up. Right. Or when a question was asked that people weren't sure of, and so they thought about it for a while. I was once lecturing on heat transfer. And so uh, in that case, as it turns out, um, air has a much lower thermal, has a much lower thermal conductivity. Make sure you get it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, making a mistake is great. Making yeah. a mistake is an opportunity to stop and repeat. Uh -huh. And every time you repeat, it allows somebody to anticipate. From the student's standpoint, whenever you can anticipate what the professor is about to say, there's something magical about that moment. And the professor can provide you that opportunity subtly by repeating themselves or by correcting themselves. Because in this case, the student's mind is faster than your mouth, mm -hmm. and they'll be ahead of you. And that's a tremendous feeling. To so a do you deliberately but make mistakes? No, I make enough by accident <laughs> that, it, that it serves me quite fine. Okay. Um, but uh, anyway, back to the thermal conductivity. If air has a low thermal conductivity, why don't we make the walls out of air? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, the reason is the air just blows in and out, and that's convection. So then the explanation is that even though I grew up in a house with storm windows, with two panes of glass that were far apart, about this far, all that needed to be done to make good thermal windows was to bring about this close together so there wouldn't be convection. Mm -hmm. Student raised his hand. So I worked in construction for years, and these windows are filled with argon. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. Let's think about it. So we started talking about what are the properties of argon. It's a monatomic gas. And we got half the story. But then afterwards, I spoke with the student. I think it's, it's not everything. So we did a web search, and we found the rest of the story. The two halves of the story are that as a monotonic gas, its uh, specific heat at constant volume is smaller than other gases, which means that it will accept uh, different amount of heat per temperature change in the right direction, good. And then the other thing is because it's argon, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. And so in bouncing back and forth between the two panes, it moves a little more slowly. So those two things put together make it an insulating. And I didn't know. And the student knew something that I didn't. And everybody remembers a lecture like that. So um, you can't be afraid of being derailed. Actually, being derailed is the best possible thing, because in the train wreck, that's when 
everybody's paying attention, everybody's learning, and it's an interesting, memorable event. The other, I think, s positive side effect of that is it makes you more human, which makes you more approachable by the student. They, they feel more comfortable talking to you after class, coming to your office hours, all those sorts of things. I agree, I agree. I, um, um, one of the things, and actually I teach this to grad students most often, is that there is a fantastic answer to a question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because it's true. Right. Um, and it's much better than another answer that goes by in an acronym MSU that uh, in the nice form is make stuff up. <laughs> um, and often, you know, people, I should supply an answer. So they just say something. And, I thought you were uh, going to say something about Michigan State University. No, I wasn't. <laughs> but uh, you can imagine what the S would be in another context. But make stuff up is not what you want to do as a faculty member. Mm -hmm. Showing, uh, you know, even a level of vulnerability to the student that, gee, I don't know that. So what are we going to do? You know, how would we find out? Where would we go? What location would have the answer? And, you know, you can throw in why this is interesting. Because probably there is something interesting about it. When I learned about the argon, I also found out that the most expensive wetsuits, instead of having air bubbles in the foam of the wetsuit, they have bubbles of argon hmm. for the same reason. Okay. So, Now, storytelling is not, again, a natural skill everybody has. And also, it's very hard sometimes to come across stories that would be appropriate. Do you have any hints on how to develop stories or where to find them or, you know? That's, that's a good question. Um, for me, I tend to go around um, looking at things and putting them into uh, the context I'm familiar with, which is a physical explanation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was taught, to look at those metal garbage cans over there. What do you notice about them? Mm -hmm. Had a physics professor. We're just walking across campus. Oh, what do I notice about them? They're metal. They're shiny. I hadn't even noticed this pattern that looks like scales on a fish mm -hmm. that was the crystal of the zinc that was used to protect the steel. Mm -hmm. Wow, you learn something. And so I guess I was taught to observe and classify. And then that leads to stories. So maybe um, tell a story about when you got your own insights into how things work. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, somehow you came to this realization. And there's a way in which you understand it. And if there's uh, a context that when you think of a particular topic, you say, of course, you know, I remember Professor John Brown Newman when he poured that liquid nitrogen on that unexpecting student, um, <laughs> which happened. Um, okay. Then suddenly that's a story. And you say, why do I understand? Why do I remember that so clearly? Well, the reason you remember something so clearly as the association of something that you're about to teach is because it had an impact on you and it was somehow interesting. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a story about people or anything like that, but if you take a concept and you personally have inside, not just an intellectual, I remember which page of so-and-so book this was on, but you have some reflection of that. Um, on how it impacted you, that's also a story, even if it, it, it doesn't involve a circumstance and some people and funny things happening. Okay. So we've talked about enunciation. We've talked about getting some coaching on performance on the stage, use of humor, storytelling in mm -hmm. particular. Any other strategies? Well, you have to work very carefully, once you've got the student's attention, to discern whether they're understanding it. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing. Obviously, if you don't have their attention, it doesn't matter what you say. You won't have communicated any understanding. But even once you have the attention, it's important to use the same eye contact to try to discern whether you're communicating effectively. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that with 300 students in a room. But there if they're all many. head down taking notes, how are you getting this eye contact? Oh, they're all not the all head down taking notes. Okay. Um, they'll, they'll look up now and again. And also, just as in poker, there are tells. Mm -hmm. You know, certain people are not good poker players because you know by their mannerisms, there's a tell. They have a good hand or a bad hand, and then you can bet against it. There will be, in a large class, some students whose facial expression, posture, mannerisms, uh, expression, or something